Welcome to The Living Legends. I am Fayaz Qureshi. In this edition of The Living Legends, we speak to a man who brought glory to this country when in the middle, as they would say in his sport, for 15 years. He has followed the path that his elder brothers took and has excelled as a player and now as a coach. He has been referred to as the best batsman to have never played test cricket. 3,428 ODI runs, 345 T20 international runs, 4,728 first class runs and 6,100 list A runs. And we haven't counted the wickets taken yet. On The Living Legends, we hear the story of Steve Ticolo. Steve, welcome to The Living Legends. You're a true cricketing legend. And I've been a very big fan of yours for years. Uh, growing up, watching you play cricket uh, in the middle order, and getting in Kenya all those runs that we always needed. And you, most of, the, most of the time, got them for us. Welcome to The Living Legends. Thank you, Faiz. Thank you for having me. And, um, okay, let's start off. Let's talk about you. You're the focal point of our show. Talk us about your early life and schooling. Uh, I was born uh, in Park Road. Park Road is in uh, Ngara area. Mm -hmm. uh, a family of uh, 10 kids. I was the second last born. Born. Uh, grew up in Park Road. Went to school uh, at Pumani Primary for the primary education. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Isili High School yeah. for the secondary ed education. Then I went to college at a computer training center for diploma in computer IT. Well, interesting. You were trained in computers, eh? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, Tell us how it all happened. Of course, uh, your brothers, Storm and David, had already picked up that bug uh, as you grew up in Gara. And uh, how did this cricketing bug get to you? Well, uh, as young kids, Park Road is close to Sa'ali Muslim Club. Mm -hmm. And Sa'ali Muslim Club, uh, cricket is played there. So as young kids, we used to go to Sa'ali Muslim Club and, and watch the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is how we picked up the interest. And by watching the games, by the side, we would play our own cricket matches as young boys. We used to use tennis balls right. and uh, beds carved out of wood. Uh, as Most cricketers start off with tennis balls, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's a replica to a hard ball. Right. But, so you kind uh, of tape it up, right? Yeah, yeah, tape it up. To give it that heaviness. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, a tennis ball is not as hard as the hard ball. Course, so, you know, yeah. you don't get injured. Yeah. And uh, as we played the matches on the sides, uh, we picked up the interest. Uh, then later on, uh, there's a gentleman, he's late now, his name is Premji, Premji Koda. Mm -hmm. Noticed the talent in us. Right. And he's the one who took us up and uh, we started training with Swamibapa Cricket Club. That is how we, we came up. Initially, it was my elder brothers, Tom Tikolo, David Tikolo. And so your career started with Swamibapa? Yeah. My career started with Swami Bapa Cricket Club. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom was already there, Tom and my other brother, David. Right. And some of the senior guys in Park Road, like the Suji brothers, mm -hmm. the Odumbe brothers. Yes. Uh, so that is how we picked up cricket. And uh, at Swami Bapa, I started off playing in the B side. There was the A side and the, and B, the B side. side. Yes, yeah. I do so remember that. Uh, I started off playing in the B side. And uh, because of my performance in the B side, I was promoted to the senior side, which was the A team. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I remember those days uh, in the 80s. Cricket was amazing in Kenya. And people used to turn out in huge numbers to come and support their team. Now, talking about the Odumbes and Sujis, uh, how did this band of brothers, including you guys, grow into these formidable cricketers that you eventually became? Yeah, as uh, days went by, uh, some of the guys moved to other clubs, like the Odumbes moved to Aga Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, Sujis also moved to Aga Khan. And uh, the league became competitive right. because of you know, players moving to other clubs. Right. Uh, this is how the game started growing. And like you rightly said, uh, cricket then had a huge following. So for us, it was a matter of uh, playing good cricket and showing your skills. And uh, every time we read our names in the newspapers the following Monday after, after Sunday, right. you know, it was something to cherish. So for us, the motivation... It was amazing support. I remember me going 
uh, to watch every match, yeah, supporting your respective team, mm. and massive crowds. And the finals were just something else in those days. Yeah, and it was, you know, it was big rivalry. And very competitive. Yeah, whether Swami Bapa playing Aga Khan or Aga Khan playing Saali mm -hmm. or Swami Bapa playing Jim Kana, it was very big rivalry then. Yes. Mm. So, so sport in Kenya, besides athletics, uh, in 1990 was an amateur kind of sport. Uh, what risk did you take in uh, becoming a cricketer full time? Uh, at that time, you know, like I said, uh, for us, the motivating factor was reading your name in the newspaper and uh, wearing the Kenya jersey. Mm -hmm. As a young kid, my dream was to play for my country yeah. because my brothers were already there. So for me, they were role models who I was looking up to. I want to become like Tom. He's wearing the, uh, the Kenya blazer, the Kenya jersey. And that was my motivation. Uh, then... Uh, and cricket was making strides. Kenyan cricket at that point was making strides, you know. Yes. We were slowly coming onto the global map. Yeah, and uh, we also started getting teams coming to play in Kenya, like teams from South Africa. Once South Africa were brought back into international sports, yeah. teams from South Africa started coming to play in Kenya. And this is where we got to know that if you perform well, somebody could be watching and you could be picked to go and play for, for a team in South Africa or England. Plus, playing other teams, international teams, better teams than you, also improves you, doesn't it? Definitely, yeah. You need to be exposed to stronger international teams. De definitely. That's when, how you'll get better. Mm, when you play stronger opposition, you learn a lot, mm. you become better, and it also takes away that fear of playing in a big game. And for us, once that started happening, teams from South Africa, from England, from India, coming to play us here, we became better cricketers, better players. And I think there was funding at that point in time, isn't it? At that time... Uh, Kenya Cricket Association was being run very well. Yeah, Kenya Cricket Associ Association was being run well. There was uh, a bit of funding coming from ICC, International Cricket Council, mm -hmm. because Kenya was an associate country yes. affiliated to ICC. And so you had official ODI status at that point in time? No, at that time we didn't. At that time you didn't? No, no, we didn't. It was later on. ODI status came in 1998. Oh, mm. yeah. Going back to Nairobi, Jim Carter, Sorali, Swabi Bapa, Simba Union, Aga Khan, etc. Very competitive. Eh? It used to get extremely, extremely competitive. Cricket had become like a religion for certain people at that point in time. Yes, and uh, you know, grounds would be full. Mm. Say it, it's a final of uh, Uhuru Cup or yes. the knockout tournament. Right. Grounds would be full. Maximum packed and you know people cheering for their teams. Adrenaline's at an all-time high. <laughs> it was you know it was big rivalry. A big rivalry at that point in time. Mm. But this there have been some great cricketers that have that have come out from all these amazing uh, you know teams. But I, I hope we can get back to that glory. We'll talk about that later. Now getting your call up to the national team. Uh, how did this come about? And of course with Tom, your brother as captain. Uh, my first call-up was uh, 1991. I missed out uh, 1990 when the team travelled to Holland to play in the ICC Trophy. Okay. I uh, had done very well in the, in the league. I had scored about 900 runs. Wow. I was second on the table to... The, the, the top guy was a professional from India, Sandeep Patil. And I was second with 900 runs. You were second? Yeah. But I missed out. I was 19 then. I missed out because of disciplinary issues. There's an incident that happened in a final match. We were playing against Aga Khan and words were exchanged. Mm. Almost we came to blows. blows. <laughs> you know, uh, you're still young and adrenaline running. No, but that's, I think, growing <laughs> up, uh, sporty abilities and fighting for your team. The rivalry comes in, you know, so, uh, so it's expected. I, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was disciplined. I was banned for three games and I missed out on that national tour because of that. And that is why I said, Steve, you must never ever again give selectors a chance, a chance to drop you because of disciplinary issues. Let them drop you because you're not performing, your, your form is poor. But other side shows... But no. Let's put it this way, that was a lesson well learned. Yeah. yeah that was it a, came at an early point in your time, mm, in your career, mm. and you made sure that would never happen again. Yeah, so then the, the, the following year again I performed well, and my first call-up was uh, against a uh, county side from... England, Lancashire, Lancashire County. They had uh, come to tour Kenya. That is the first break I got to play for the wow, national Wow, you played team. for Lancashire, huh? Yeah. How was the experience? It was good. Uh, initially, 
I was overawed, you know, being 19, 20 years playing for the national team for the first time, fear, jitters, mm. butterflies in the stomach. So the first game I didn't get runs, but the second game I got a 50. And, uh, you know, for me that was something to, to, to cherish. To cherish, 100% mm -hmm. at an inter international level, mm -hmm. which is pretty good. Now, Kenya qualified for the 1996 Cricket World Cup. What was the feeling and uh, making your debut against India? Yeah, so after the debut against Lancashire, we had about three, three years before the next ICC, they, they used to call it uh, ICC Trophy, which was a qualifier to the World Cup to for the World associate Cup, yes. countries. Uh, which the ICC trophy was held in Nairobi 1994 mm -hmm. and we came second to UAE. That is how we qualified for the 96 World Cup. Uh, again, in the 1994 ICC trophy, myself and Maurice Odumbe were the highest run scorers for the Kenya team. And uh, that ensured that Kenya qualified for the 96 World Cup. Now going to the 96 World Cup, was something huge for us. Huge, huge. Kenya playing in the World Cup, mm. Cricket World Cup. It's like Arambe Stars playing in the, in the football, football World, World Cup. Cup. Yeah, going, the FIFA, yes. Yeah, they're going to play yes. Brazil, Argentina. So for us, we were playing uh, India, Australia, Zimbabwe was part of our group, and uh, Sri Lanka and West Indies. Now, Actually, it was actually amazing for Kenya to be a part of that elite group. You know, limited resources, but you're rubbing shoulders with India, Pakistan, England, West Indies, you know, absolutely amazing. Yeah, definitely. And, and for us, we looked at it from a point of view that these are guys, you know, we've grown up just watching them on TV, seeing them in magazines. Mm -hmm. And now we are on the same ground with them, yes. playing against them, rubbing shoulders with them. I tell you, fires. <laughs> It, it, you know, it was something remarkable for us. Yeah. Mm. It must have been an amazing feeling. Definitely, and, uh, yeah. Taking your cricket to another level as well. Yeah. Being exposed to all these international players. Okay. Now, the most important thing about that 96 World Cup, when you beat the West Indies, I mean, headlines across the globe. People couldn't believe it. Kenya beats the West Indies. And how did this change the perception of Kenyan cricket after that uh, win over West Indies? Uh, that win did a lot for us. Uh, I remember once the game was over, we, we didn't realize what we had done. It was only two, three days later that we realized. I mean, your parents at the World Cup, people must have said they'll get experience and they'll go back yeah. home. But winning West Indies was just unbelievable. Yeah, and West Indies being two times uh, world champions. Yes. Uh, they ruled cricket for so mm, many decades. Mm. And to beat West Indies, was such an amazing achievement. Yeah, and so that victory changed a lot for, for Kenya cricket. Mm. Even now the management of Kenya cricket started looking at the game in a positive way that, you know, we can make this become a very big sport. Right. And for us players, we felt if we can beat West Indies, yeah. we can compete yeah, well, against... I think it was Rajabali, right, who took all the wickets. Yeah, yeah. Rajabali took three wickets, three yeah. vital wickets, yeah. Brian Lara being one of them. Yes. And like I was saying, as, as players now we felt we are capable of competing against any, any country. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Now, the 1999 World Cup uh, was a huge challenge for Kenya. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, 1999 World Cup was in England. Uh, very tough conditions to play cricket in. Mm. <laughs> the ball swings the a ball lot. The ball swings a lot moves there. Up, yeah, yeah, moves around. Yeah. And it's, you know, cold. You're playing in freezing, freezing temperatures. We from Africa used to the heat and all right. that. So, you know, there were, there, there were challenges both on the you have field. to go back, I mean, you have to go there and acclimatize, mm. change of weather, uh, the ball swinging so much, you know, your batting expertise <laughs> yeah. comes to the fore. Mm, but, 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 but at that time, because of limited resources, Kenya Cricket Association didn't have enough funds. So we went, I think, a few days before the tournament started. Yeah. We didn't have that opportunity to, you know, really acclimatize. But yeah, you know, it was a challenge. We didn't win any game in that tournament, but uh, we, we were competitive in the games, mm -hmm. but lost all, you know, all the games. But I think, like I said, you know, you learn from these experiences, yeah? Now, you actually had Unga flown to the UK so that you could have a Ugali. <laughs> Tell us more about this. <laughs> uh, I think the, the guys, uh, you know, we, 
guys wanted something from home, food from home. We, mm -hmm. we, we had gotten used to burgers and chips and all that. Yeah. So uh, in one of the team meetings, uh, I think it was Morris who said, we, we're missing food from home. And uh, because Emirates was the official sponsors of uh, the World Cup, right. uh, our team manager, the late Harry, put in a good word for us uh, to the Emirates that if we get uh, a bale of unga from Nairobi, would you guys fly it over to London? Yeah. And they said, yeah, why not? <laughs> so unga was flown to London and uh, we cooked to Gali. We yeah. were allowed into one of the kitchens of the, of the hotel we were staying at. Right. And uh, it is us players who cooked the Ugali. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, 2003, the journey to the semis before Saurav Ganguly won it for India. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, that journey started uh, immediately after the 99 World Cup. Yeah. Uh, Kenya Cricket Association uh, saw it fit to get as a full-time coach, Sandeep Patil. Prior to that, uh, the coaches used to come maybe two, three months before the tournament. Right. Uh, before that, it was the late Hanuman Singh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 99, they got Patil on board. So we had uh, Sandeep Patil from 99 to two or three. He was okay. based here in Kenya, mm -hmm. so we were training full time. And during that period, also late '98, breweries came on board. Kenya breweries as sponsors. As sponsors, and this allowed the players to have a, a salary, where now you're a full time cricketer. Your and you're job, being paid. Yeah, yeah, your job is to practice and play cricket. Did it make a difference having an uh, international coach? It did. It did big time for us. Because the, the things that Sandy Patil brought on board, uh, game awareness, tactics, uh, skills, working on your skills, really helped us. And uh, during that phase, we also played a lot of cricket. We had teams coming to Kenya from India, the Ranji Trophy teams. We had teams from South Africa, the province teams. We also used to travel to Sri Lanka, play Sri Lanka, eh, Pakistan, eh, India. Eh. So we had a lot of cricket during that period, 99 to two or three, and the team gelled so well. We had become different players, just because you're now full -time, a full-time cricketer, practicing, playing cricket, talking cricket, sleeping cricket, and uh, the results were there to be seen in two or three. Incentives were given, and it does make a difference. Yeah, it does, it, it does. Incentives were given uh, because now KCA had a sponsor, they could afford to say, guys, if you win a game, you get extra amount. Apart from your salary, you get extra amount. If you win a tournament, there's extra amount. So, so that inspires you? Definitely does, because, you know, apart from your salary, you want to earn that extra shilling. Yep, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, there were disputes about contracts around this time. Um, the Kenya Cricket Association having their perception, the players having theirs. Um, how did you resolve these disputes and how did this affect the local game? Uh, during that time, uh, the disputes that were there was just before the two or three World Cup. The contracts we had as players, right. uh, there was a clause that said, uh, if we go to the World Cup, whatever money KCA would get from the World Cup as profits, 25% mm -hmm. uh, would come to the players. Right. But when the World Cup was near, I think, the guys in KC wanted to play, you know, you know, be funny with that clause. Mm. And that is why the players said, no, we have contracts, we have to go with the contracts. Whatever is in the contract, whatever is due to us, we must get that. But that was resolved. We sat down with the Kenya Cricket uh, Board mm -hmm. and that was resolved. This was prior It was to eventually the, sorted out. Yeah, this was prior to the 2003 World Cup. Mm -hmm. The other issues were now cricket started going So it was resolved going before going for the World Cup? Yeah, yeah it was resolved was before good. going, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise your mindset would have been an absolute mess going Yeah, there. yeah, definitely. You know, as With all these issues hanging. As a sportsman, sportswoman, you want your mind to be focused on the game or 100%. The, the discipline you're, you're, you're playing. Um, you also played abroad, uh, of course you played for Lancashire, then of course in Bangladesh as well? Yeah, I played in Bangladesh. I played. You're beating uh, Morris Adumbe in records. <laughs> <laughs> I played uh, in Zimbabwe. I also played in South Africa. So, because of the performances, like I was saying earlier on, 
you wanted to do well so that teams from outside see you and poach you as a you know as a professional mm -hmm. and uh we got those opportunities in bangladesh in south africa in the uk and in zimbabwe which is pretty good mm -hmm. Uh, for Kenyan cricketers at that point in time? Definitely, as a, as a cricketer or a sports person, when you go to play in different conditions mm -hmm. against different players, you learn a lot. And what you've learned, you bring back to the national team. Plus, it showed that Kenyan cricketers were being appreciated for their talent. Definitely. And yeah. people were looking at you and recognizing you, mm -hmm. and your abilities and your, your, your talent. Mm -hmm. um, you left the scene around 2009 and went into coaching. What is, how was this transition? Uh, after the 2009 was a qualifier for the 2011 World Cup. I was the captain then. Uh, after the oh, sorry, going back, you actually became the captain for Kenya from 2002 till 2009. Yeah. Two. In fact, you captained two World Cups, right? Yeah, the 2003, 2003 and 2007 in Seven. the West Indies. Right. Yeah. So 2009, after the qualifier, which was in South Africa, we qualified for the 2011 World Cup is when I stepped down as a captain. I felt my, my time as, as a captain had come to, to an end. Let's I think you just know as a sportsman yeah. when to step down. Yeah. So you let a young player take over because mm. 2009, you give them something like two years to prepare for the 2011 World Cup. Yeah. So after that, I moved to Zimbabwe where I was appointed a coach player of the Southern Rocks franchise. So I was in Zimbabwe for two years, two, 2009 and 2010. And then uh, 2011, uh, Cricket Kenya asked me to come back and play in the 2011 World Cup. They needed a number of senior players in the team because at that time the team had a lot of juniors. Oh, so, th so there was a comeback, huh? Yeah. 2011, <laughs> you were there? Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> it was a comeback. So. I agreed because my country was calling it. It was to, very, very important. Yeah. A call from your country. Why mm. would you say no? Yeah, to come back and be part of that and World it's Cup. A, it's an extreme honor. Mm. Mm. So we went to the 2011 World Cup in India. Uh, things didn't go well. We didn't win even a single game. But for me, it was more of the younger guys growing up. Yeah. And you, you were there more as a mentor, a player, you know, yeah. grooming the young guys. Mm. And it must have been a great experience for them. Yeah, so that once we leave, you know, they can take over. The transition continues. Yeah, the places of yeah. Steve Ticolo, Maurice Odile. Now, coaching, you've created two monsters, eh? Uganda and Tanzania. They're now beating us. <laughs> what has been the journey of uh, developing the sport in uh, these countries? Uh, before I went to Uganda, I was coach of uh, the Kenya Under-19 for one year. We missed out on the World Cup. Uh, we lost to Namibia in the finals of the qualifier which was very painful. And then after that year, I was made the coach of the senior team, which I did for two years. Then I moved to Uganda in 2016. Uganda was with them from 2016 to 2019. And uh, when I went to Uganda, their cricket was at a low level. And I worked very hard for those four years to, to bring their game up. They've done really well. <laughs> Sadly, as we speak, they beat Kenya yesterday in the semi-final of the Africa uh, Cup. Mm. Extremely sad. Very uh, sad. So I, I, I left Uganda end of 2019. I got a two-year contract with uh, Tanzania 2020 and 2021. Again, Tanzania's cricket was at a low level. Those two years, they were the two years of COVID. I worked very hard with the, with the players just to change a number of things. They are playing styles, tactics. So these two planning. countries really have to thank you. <laughs> and us Kenyans, where we could have used you even more, we didn't. Sad state of affairs. Now, what would be your advice to those in charge of sport today, coming to that? I think uh, our sports is where it is at. When you look at cricket, look at football. Rugby is also going down. For me, I think it's just poor management. And I've never shied away from saying this. We don't manage our sports very well. I think constructive criticism is important. Mm. We don't manage our sports very well. I think uh, when you look at people who come to run sports, for me the intentions are not the bigger picture, which is the game, and uh, raise the, you know, the level of the game. 
for me it's usually individual people wanting to benefit from what is there if it's financial or using it as a stepping stone to other things like politics and become an MP, become a cabinet minister. So it's never the sports. Which matters. It's yeah. just being used as a stepping stone to, to go other places. Yeah. Which so, is sad, isn't it? So if, if we can get administrators who are dedicated, dedicated and want this, the sports to move forward, I think you know, it, it can be a very good thing. Because the talent is there. Fires, the talent is there. In cricket, I see boys who play exceptional cricket. But if the management is not right, it will not trickle down. It won't down. trickle down. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about your next plan, but before that, give me a memorable moment of your cricketing career. I think the 2003 World Cup, uh, being the captain of the team, and how the team did well to get to the semi-finals of the, of the World Cup. And just being with that team, like I said, we, that journey started 99 to 2 or 3. Having that group, the way we were, we, you know, we were like a family. Everyone was ready to die for the well next gelled. guy. Yeah. yeah. Everyone was ready to die for the next guy. And how we, we grew up as a strong unit to compete in the World Cup. I remember the... You beat Australia, right? In 2003, was it? No, no, very, very close. We very came close. very close. You came very close to beat yeah. them, sorry. You became the, game, the game that Asif picked, Asif three, Karim wickets, picked yeah. three wickets. Uh, but in that tournament, we beat Bangladesh, we beat Zimbabwe. We got three, two points from New Zealand who refused to come to Nairobi. Yeah. And we beat Sri Lanka at home. You were in the semi-finals of a World Cup. Even if you didn't win the World Cup, you were in the semi-finals. Kenya was in the semi-finals. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, that was <laughs> such oh, amazing achievement. So, yes. I hope, can we get back to those glory days? No, we can. If, if things are put right, we can. Because like I said, the talent but is there. But we need people like you at the helm of management, who's dedicated, who understands the sport. Yeah, but the, the, the politics that is played up there, they might not allow people like us to, to even get close to the chairmanship. There's a lot of politics that is played. Oh, I, I really wish you all the best. What is your next plan? Uh, my next plan... Uh, For a legend like you. I've gotten a number of offers to, to go and coach outside. Uh, Nigeria have called. I've got two calls, one from the US and one from uh, South Africa. So at, at the moment, I'm, I'm weighing my options. options. <laughs> and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Steve Ticolo, a true cricketing living legend. Thank you so much for gracing this show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fayez, for having me. Santa Sana. Asante. It's been a pleasure speaking to Steve Ticolo, Kenya's top batsman in cricket and a former captain of the side. He worked as a coach in Uganda and Tanzania, and now those sides are giving Kenya a run for their money. He still wants to work more to develop the sport that made him an easily recognizable figure in global cricket. Guns, as they call him, has fired from all barrels today. Thank you for watching. I am Fayaz Qureshi.